Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com. Happy to welcome him back, our guest, Worshipful Brother Nicholas Broadway. Welcome back. Thank you, Michael. I'm pleased to be back again. He's the past master of Stonewell Lodge, number 9137 in the UK, and is also the publisher of The Square magazine. I had to throw the UK in because the last time I had you on, <laughs> there were some questions. I'm like, yeah, if you couldn't tell from the accent, he's from across the pond. And joins us as we explore the insides of the Royal Arch in English Freemasonry, where there's, some would say, a stronger bond between the Blue Lodge or Symbolic Lodges and Royal Arch than here in the States. So doing my homework, I was looking into the U.S. and our Royal Arch, which uh, for those outside of the craft is just another body that exists outside of uh, your Blue Lodge, your, your Symbolic Lodge. Ours trace back to the original colonies, with prominent chapters being established in Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. I imagine your story, your origin story, a little different in England. What is the history of the Royal Arch there? So we have various timelines, um, but it goes back to the late uh, 1730s. That's when it would have first been worked. And in England, it was worked in craft lodges. So there was not a separate body. It would just be worked in, a, in an ordinary craft lodge. Um, and as you're probably aware or may not be aware, in England, prior to the Union in 1813, we had two grand lodges in operation in England. We had the Moderns or Premier Grand Lodge, which was the first Grand Lodge, members and then later on we had a second um, group of English Freemasons who were known as the Ancients. So the Ancients came after the Moderns um, but they claimed that they practiced ancient Freemasonry and the two groups didn't really get on very well um, would be an understatement and around about the end of the uh, 18th century um, the Duke of Sussex decided that he wanted to unite the two Grand Lodges in England under one body. Um, and he appointed his, or arranged to get his uh, brother appointed as the um, Grand Master of the Ancients. And they set around for a few years to, to, to work out how they would combine the two Grand Lodges together. And after a lot of discussions, on the 27th of December, 1813, a declaration was signed and the United Grand Lodge of England was formed. One of the stumbling blocks was Royal Arch, because in the um, moderns, grand, moderns Lodges, they were three degrees, the apprentice, fellow craft and master, and the, um, they didn't do too much of uh, Royal Arch, but they did, did, did some Royal Arch. Um, but in the ancient lodges, they were four degrees, which was the end of the apprentice, the of the master, and Royal Arch. So when they wanted to combine together, there was a difficulty because one group wanted three degrees and the Royal Arch, and the other wanted four degrees. The wording, which became a little bit of a um, fudge, which is um, uh, affectionately known as the Sussex fudge. I thought that was a joke term. I didn't realize it was a real term. <laughs> yeah, so Sussex, the Duke of Sussex, was the Grand Master of the Moderns who, who led this um, union. And it became a fudge in the end, and the wording reads, um, it is declared and pronounced that pure ancient masonry consists of three degrees and no more. These are those of the inter-apprentice, the fellow craft, and the master mason, including the supreme order of Holy Royal Arch. So one group read that 
as four degrees, and the other group read that as three, including the Royal Arch. Mm. So they both thought they'd won the argument. And the declaration was signed on, as I say, on December the 27th. And then um, we move forward. Even um, certificates for uh, R- Royal Arch were, weren't issued very often in the very early days. They didn't really start issuing certificates until the end of the 18th century. Interesting. And in fact, more didn't even issue certificates until the beginning of the 19th century. So, no, it um, hasn't got a huge, uh, uh, as a full history as, as the craft. So are you a companion, a member of the Royal Arch? I am. I, I, I think I went about after about five years of joining craft Freemasonry, then I joined um, the chapter, and then I was went through the, my first time through the chair of my lodge, and then a few years later went through the chair of the Royal Arch. Oh, so you're a priest then? You've well, I'm not a high priest because we don't have that title. But we, the the um, the 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 principal officer is Zerubbabel. And so I'm a pastor of Zerubbabel, basically, a PZ. Okay, interesting. So that's right. how we refer it, yes. Interesting. Yeah, it's. I think for New Masons listening, they're like, what are they talking about? And it almost is another language into itself. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. uh, a companion, which is a brother that has been uh, gone through the degrees and has been obligated now to become a Royal Archmason. Me getting into it was much different, I think, and there was an English connection even back then. I was very close with a brother who's uh, since passed and and laid down his working tools, but he told me, oh, you want to do the Royal Arch degree because that completes the third degree. And I went through it, but I didn't feel that it really completed or answered any questions I had about the third degree. I just felt it told another story that now opened up a whole new set of questions without giving away any of the obligations or the secrets of, of the degrees, did you find your English Royal Arch degree ritual to be the same or did you understand it as you went through? No, uh, I didn't understand it at all. And partly because I think when you, when I've read some of the old versions of the degree, you know, hundred year old versions there was much more involved, much more to it. But it took, obviously, a lot longer to go work the degree. Mm. And over the years, Grand Lodge has chopped bits out to speed the process up. And, of course, you just miss big chunks out of, uh, out of the process. In England, um, we worked um, a version of the degree, which is called Passing of the Vials. I'm not sure whether you're aware of that term. And this is where you go through vows. You go through the steps and you go through vows. And um, it takes a lot, it's a lot more of a full degree and it takes much longer to to, um, to complete. And um, I think with that, you get a, a much clearer understanding. Looking at the Grand Lodge, United Grand Lodge of England website today, their description of the Royal Arch, and it says, in England and Wales, there is an indissolvable link between craft Freemasonry and the Royal Arch, with the Royal Arch being considered the completion of a Freemason's journey in pure ancient masonry. So now what United Grand Lodge of England are presenting the Royal Arch as, or free pure ancient masonry as a journey, it's four steps. It was four degrees at one stage. Then they they did away with that. Now it is um, four steps. It's a journey. It's not a completion of the Master Masons any longer. It was when I joined. Um, But I don't think it ever was a completion. In the third degree, you're told the passwords are lost. And in the Royal Arge, you're, you're, you're t- something else is completely discovered. It's got nothing to do with 
Well, it's it's the new story that's literally unearthed. That uh, the first three degrees in the symbolic lodge are telling you the story of the building of King Solomon's temple, which you actually never, as a master mason, get to see finished. Which is a bit of the history of the Bible because we do know that it was destroyed. But the symbol, or uh, sorry, the symbolism in Blue Lodge is, is that you are to be working to finish your symbolic temple, which there's debate on whether that is completed the day that you lay down your working tools or is it through living the virtues of the lessons and uh, everything you've picked up in ritual? Well, that's very interesting that you say that because in um, in English Freemasonry, when we uh, become an installed master, part of that ritual is the temple is finished and part of the ritual you get is is the celebration of it being completed as part of the ritual of being an installed master. Hmm. That would be, yeah, I think that would be rewarding. And also basically why I think here in the U S they tell us that the York right is, you know, the in chapter, it's also referred to as York, right? That's why it completes the Holy Royal arch degree completes the experience because for a lot of men, the opportunity to become the brother of your lodge because we had such booming numbers, which is not the case, sadly, now (laughs) in modern times. But uh, about 20 or 30 years ago, when we had huge membership numbers in lodges, it was very hard to become the master of your lodge and be invested with the secrets of the chair was the term that is used here. So the York Rite became incredibly popular because you could go through and one of the degrees is the virtual past master or the virtual master, which is you actually going through and raising a lodge and sitting a lodge and getting to do some of the functions of being the master so you can have that gavel of authority for a while, hold that office, because in the U.S., the requirement to get into York Rite is that you had to be a past master of your lodge, which they've now since dropped. Was that one of the early requirements for you in England? A um, hundred years ago, yes, you would have had to have been an installed master before you could join the Royal Arch. And I think in um, in England, they saw that as a bit of a, a bottleneck. So they started to reduce it. And um, so they changed various words and passwords and they... the the. They reduced the qualification so you had to have been an, a master mason for four weeks and upwards. Then you could join the Royal Arch. And then over the years, you could only go, you could only progress in the Royal Arch to certain positions until you had been an installed master. And even now, you can't go through the chair, the, 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 the first principal's chair in Royal Arch until you've been an installed master. You can go through other chairs, but you can't go through the principal's chair until you've been an installed master. And for clarification, some of this is foreign to me only because I have not been elected or installed the master of the lodge yet. However, <laughs> benefit of being in two different jurisdictions in New York State and then in Washington, D.C., is that one night I accidentally went to a, a master's degree, which I thought was the master mason's degree. And I showed up and I saw, you know, 12 guys sitting in the room I'm like, wow, this is going to be a very long night if, if this is what we're doing. And long story short, it was the installation of the incoming masters in the district. And I was almost allowed into the room until they said, oh, are you a, a past master? Or the other term would be an immediate past master. I'm like, oh, no, I am not a worshipful brother. I have not gone through. Oh, well, you can't be here for this because only past masters can be a part of this. So I was like, oh, OK. And then one of the older brothers and God bless older brothers for <laughs> being older brothers was like, well, if you've already gone through the York right, you've pretty much already done this degree, so you wouldn't have to come in and do it. And I'm like, oh, that's so defeating. If that's the same degree, I've experienced that, except for the secret of the chair, which there has to be something that they would give you as the incoming master of the lodge. Which also gets the point for me, uh, when I was going through chapter or or the Red Lodge is another term that is used. In the U.S., uh, in the jurisdiction that I was in, 
um, my mother lodge actually had an active chapter. And then another lodge that I had affiliated with, they had a chapter that was also there. Um, chapter here, depending on what part of the U.S. that you're in, for example, in the Northeast, it tends to be a lot stronger with members and representation versus in the South or the Southwest even, where the Scottish Rite is more prominent because of the differences. Do you find it, the York Rite to be something that all English Freemasons eventually progress to, or do some venture into the other bodies that are available? Um, again, on looking on the current uh, United Grand Lodge website, they claim um, a, approximately 40% of members are Royal Arch members. So I think it's just, I think that's uh, a bit ambitious. I think it's a little bit less than that, but let's say 40%. I also have heard from various sources um, on other um, conferences that 20% of existing craft members have left, joined the Royal Arch and left. Mm. So there's still a lot of people who did join but didn't get on with it and have left. So the, my answer to your question is no. It's not a, it's not a big take-up. So United Grand Lodge generally wants to direct people from the craft into Royal Arch. But we also have the other degrees, which you have in York, called the Mark degree. Now, the Mark degree is run by a different body in London, Mark Mason's Hall. That's a different organisation. There is a very small trend I've, I've noticed recently where people, members, have opted not to go into Royal Arch first but go and do the Mark degree first, hmm. then do the Royal Arch. Now, quite often in the past, I would say, the Mark has been presented as the completion of the Fellow Crafts degree as chapter is the completion of the master's degree so you would naturally want to complete the fellow craft first before you would complete the master masons however to undertake the mark degree you have to be a master mason interesting there is a little bit but um of confusion there we've also have another uh, degree which is which is administered through Mark Mason's Hall, which is Royal and Select Masters, which is also part of your York Rite. And that is a four-degree order which connects the craft and the Royal Arch. The first two, in terms of time, overlap the third degree, and then the other two are further down in time. So... What happens um, in the in, in, under English constitutions? Yeah, we we do the craft chapter is five hundred years in down the line. So what hap what's happened? Right, we don't know. The Royal and Select Masters fills a little bit of that story, and I have to say, having recently completed the Royal and Select Master, it does fill in the gaps for chapter, and it makes chapter a little bit more interesting from that point of view. And I'm glad you picked up that because I, I fumbled the ball there. It's uh, I, I forgot to let our listener know, oh, yeah, in Blue Lodge, the story ends here. And then that's where chapter picks up is sometime afterwards when King Solomon's temple is destroyed. Yes. The question is, do we rebuild, which in the U.S., which I thought was kind of beautiful with how our Royal Arch ends is... They literally go to a corner in the lodge room as part of the ritual and say, oh, look what we discovered over here. There's a crypt in this corner that's got uh, more secrets and ancient teachings underneath. And uh, only cryptic masons can go down here. And it's the a copy of the Ark of the Covenant. You're like, oh, and this is how they get you to go into uh, cryptic masonry, which we... And in here they were purple. That's their color. Um, and then yes. from cryptic masonry, you build into... Um, Knights of well, what would be um, considered like the Knights of the Templar Commandery? It's it's technically called Knights of the Commandery, but based loosely on the legend of the Knights of the Templar. So that is the uh, another order that we have, Knights Templar. Um, so quite a lot of members do desire to join Knights uh, uh, KT 
Knights Templar. But to become a, a knight, you have to first do the Royal Arch. You have to be a companion. You come in as a companion. So I have known a number of people who have joined uh, uh, Royal Arch. They, they, then they left the Royal Arch, and yet they then joined Knights Templar. Mm. Yeah, I don't know enough about the association. I know that you do not have to be a chapter than cryptic to get into commandery because there's a number of brothers that that is appealing to to get yeah. the title sir and yeah. you're a you know a knight and you get the little sword and the chapeau and the outfit and uh it's cool <laughs> yeah it does it does look pretty cool um but also it's much more faith-based than the other uh, branches or degrees that are offered in Freemasonry. So that is also sometimes a, a hurdle or speed bump for men that are interested. Yes, in England, the Knights Templar, you have to be of a Christian. Mm. Absolutely, you have to profess the Christian faith. Um, but it's, uh, it is very different, I think, to um, the, uh, um, um, the, uh, the York Rite version. I mean, the, the, the regalia is completely different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the titles. And one thing that I yes. found that was interesting getting into the York Rite was the modes of recognition. There's more signs. There's more do guards. There's more yeah. handshakes. There's more words. Um, and I'm sitting there going, how do these guys remember all of this? That was Whereas when I went into the Scottish Rite, it there was not that it was the various degrees that exist in the Scottish Rite, um, and you could take them literally all at once or you know in massive chunks. Where in York Rite, it was more paced on what you would get in your Blue Lodge with some time yeah. in between each degree. But no, yeah. um, and I, maybe this is one thing about the appendant or concordant bodies that's appealing to some folks is there's no. Uh, Exemplification, or there is exemplification. What's the word I'm looking for? There, there's no proficiency that's required to move from de degree to degree. The proficiency, at least in the U.S., is that you're present that evening when the degree takes place. Now we do have a we we do have a, a whole structure in England of qualifications to go from one one order to the next to the next, um, and um, yeah, most of the degrees do require a membership of Royal Arch as a prerequisite and some do require both Mark and Royal Arch as a prerequisite for example um, Royal and Select Masters you have to be you have to have been a Mark Mason and a, a Royal Arch Mason. And also here in the States, our chapters are arranged very similar to our Blue Lodges, where there will be a almost district-wide chapter, usually in most areas where you'd have you know, a handful of lodges, you'll have fewer chapters just because you're basically drawing membership from the members of lodges in that area that are all underneath some sort of grand jurisdiction. So New York state has got a grand chapter, DC grand chapter, all of the, the bodies have that and they hold the same amity that exists on the blue lodge level with recognizing each other. Tell us about the organization. Cause you had mentioned it's a little bit different in England when it comes to the leadership structure for chapter in the York Rite? If we start at the top, with the under United Grand Lodge of England, um, the Duke of uh, Kent is the um, head of uh, the craft. He's also head of um, the Royal Arch. And he has a, a program master. He, he deputises for the Duke when the Duke is unavailable. And he's also the program master for craft and for um, Royal Lodge. Then up from then down, from then on, it is all divided up. They have a complete different different people for the different offices, and that's Supreme Grand Chapter. Each of the districts now, which are counties for us, so we call them provinces. We have a provincial grand master for craft. Depending on the size of that district, if it's a fairly small district, the same person will be the head of the provincial chapter, grand chapter. If it's a larger district, there may be a separate head. So in 
in, in one that I'm a member of in Sussex, it's a, the same person, is the head of the craft, is the head of the chapter. But in the county next door to me, it's much bigger, there are two different people. Um, and then coming down to the, the private lodge and the private chapter, so I would have said certainly 20 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, it was quite common for a lodge then to automatically have its own chapter. I would say that started to fade out and newer lodges that are formed now very rarely form a chapter. It's not they never do, but it's unlikely because there are many chapters that are struggling for membership. The, the two are, and what generally happens, so if um, a lodge is formed, the chapter will adopt the same number. So if, the, if your number is one, two, three, four, for the, for the craft unit, the chapter may have a different name, but it would still have the same number, one, two, three, four. Oh, that's interesting. Now, what can happen and has happened over the years, the craft unit has decided that it couldn't support itself and, and handed its warrant back. But the chapter, the chapters carried on, and these are referred to as orphan chapters because they don't have a craft unit supporting them. Now they generally do find it difficult to um, keep going. But what's happening because they're not every craft unit has a chapter; they can draw members from various craft units um i think there is now a move a general move in some of the provinces that orphan chapters find a, a lodge to associate with so they have a more permanent bond with a lodge now stonewall my mother lodge doesn't have a chapter it was a recently it's a, re, a relatively new lodge formed in 1985 uh, we never had enough we would never have had enough members to form a chapter. Um, so I joined a chapter that um, that was associated with another lodge. So, yes. So this connection between UGLE with Blue Lodge and Red Lodge, or yes, will this ever be able to be undone? And Or do you think it's beneficial for them to be together? Okay, so we talked about the Sussex Fudge earlier on. There is a school of thought to go back a little bit further in time and adopt the ancient strategy, which was to hold chapter in craft lodges. Mm. So what would happen there is the supreme, uh, the, the governing body of Royal Arch would no doubt disappear, and the work would be conducted in the craft units. The craft lodge would open for three degrees and the layout would be set out for the three degrees and then if it needed to open for a chapter it the lodge would be laid out for a chapter room which is different to um, a craft layout but the there is a group there is a school of thought that perhaps chapters should be brought in back into the craft unit mm. um, therefore members will automatically do all four steps. There would be no option. You would just do it because it's all part of it. Um, that seems to get um, as many people as hostile against that idea as there are in favour of it. It's one of those Marmite decisions. You're either really for it or you're very much against it. Um, I think time will tell. I think it will be interesting to see whether... Um, chapters do, do struggle enough that they that there is a decision at some point in the future to bring it all into one unit. Yeah, I, I work as a lodge education officer, so um, my role is you know outside of being the junior warden of the lodge, I also work with the uh, newly obligated brothers on their proficiency. Yes, and I've been doing this, and it's what I find to be one of the most rewarding parts or 
offices or positions in masonry, but I've been doing it for about four years. And the thing that I've noticed is very rarely have I had brothers who have come in, at least on the U.S. side, that have sh- expressed or shown an interest in the York Rite unless they were looking to take a path to get into the commandery because of the Knights Templar story. The 32nd degrees in the Scottish Rite is always something that they come in thinking that they need to pursue or because we have the Shriners as well here that are attached. Um, And to be a Shriner in the U.S., you have to be a Master Mason. I've had brothers that have expressed that interest as well. But I would say if, if I have spoken to 10, you know, newly raised brothers, probably three or four of them have shown an interest in the other bodies of masonry and the other six are really happy with staying centralized in Blue Lodge. Do you see that that's also part of the experience in England as well, at least in your lodge, where men want more time to figure out what the story is that they were just told? I think there's, that, there is some um, evidence of that, definitely. Also, um, in my lodge here in Sussex, we've taken a very um, different view in that we're suggesting to members, you just complete the four steps. We are promoting it as a four-step package. Mm. It is interesting that even lodge members from old school would say, oh, no, wait wait a few years before you do chat. We don't need to rush into chat. We just wait a few years. We don't gain anything by waiting a few years. You just wait a few years. There's, you know, nothing, nothing happens. You can't go through the chair of chapter until you've been through the, 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 the lodge chair anyway. Um, I, the, 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 there's, assuming that people don't know anything about Royal Arch before they go into it, I don't think there is a very clear value proposition why members should want to join it. That is the first thing. When Mm. members join it, it's very much Old Testament story. It's a very Jewish Old Testament story with um, a lot of Hebrew words. And... I think it takes, it's very difficult for them to understand. And also, a lot of it's been cut out. As I say, it's disjointed. And I think they just find what, 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 what have I done? Why? What? <laughs> Why? Right. And it's yeah. very difficult yeah. to answer. And then there are a few people who, as you say, have got Knights Templar in there on their target. And that's where they want to get to. So they have to go through this process. Right. Um, I think the, the 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 issue with the appendant bodies, whether it is York right or whether it is with you know you have the uh, Scottish right, we call that Rose Choir. I still think that the difficulty is putting forward a clear value proposition to members. That is the that's the difficulty. Um, otherwise, they just see it as another night out. Well, in our conversation tonight, you touched on a topic that I'm looking forward to as this will not be his final appearance on the Craftsman Online podcast. We're going to get Brother Broadway back to talk about some of the other issues that we have in the craft that are global, which is the membership and the retention issue. And we'll address that in the weeks to come. But until then, Brother Broadway, thank you so much for coming back on. Thank you very much for inviting me, Mark. I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you're looking for Masonic education, you can find it by visiting The Square Magazine. That's thesquaremagazine.com. A reminder that new episodes of the Craftsman Online podcast, those are available for download every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Prevail.